That's just a great way to get you started, isn't it? Man, good morning, good morning. I want to draw your attention to the screen for our morning announcements. I'm Pastor Steve Brown, and I'm dressed this way for a reason. I'm here to invite you to our first ever Carnival 55. That's a carnival for those of you... Good morning and welcome to New Hope Community Church. I'm Pastor Steve Brown and I'm dressed this way for a reason. I'm here to invite you to our first ever Carnival 55. That's a carnival for those of you 55 and older. On Tuesday, June 12th from 1130 to 1, we're going to gather together here, have some catered food. We're going to have some games, prizes, and all kinds of enjoyment. So we hope to have you with us that day. Now, just to give you an idea of what's going to be going on, Pastor Tim and Pastor Mark are going to show you how to play some of the games that we're going to do. Some of the games we have for you on the uh, 12th will be basketball, uh, beanbag toss, an end zone toss with footballs and frisbees, and a lot of other games and stuff to enjoy. So we hope to see you there. All right, don't forget, when you're at the carnival, don't forget to stop by and have your picture taken to remember the day. All you have to do is go to the photo booth and pick up this barbell. Uh, pick up the barbell. Need some help, Steve? Uh, maybe so, Mark. Oh. oh. Well, you get the picture. Men's breakfast is coming on June 9th. This month, we'll have Detective Andre Benson from the Fresno PD speaking. Uh, starts at 8 a.m. Coffee's ready at 7.30, so come join us on June 9th. Parents, have we got an event for you. Saturday, June 23rd, New Hope is going to be hosting the Next Level Parenting Conference. This is for parents of pre-teens and teenagers. That's 11, 12, all through the teenage years, even up to 18 or 19 years old. It's going to be a one-day training event starting at 8.30 in the morning, going till about 4.30 at night. Uh, lunch is included. There's going to be snacks. It's $20 per family, and you're going to come away feeling equipped and empowered to connect with your teenager on the next level. So we'd love to see you there. You can register online at newhopechurch.net. Right up top, it says Parent Conference. Click on that. Get registered today. On Saturday, June 9th, ladies, we are having another crochet class. So many of you guys came to this last one. We wanted to team with you again and give you an opportunity to finish your creations, to come meet some new ladies, and have a good time impacting kids all over the world. All of the um, knit caps that we're going to make at this crochet class are going to go in the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. So Saturday, June 9th, make sure you come. It's going to be an awesome time. Calling all young families, Jam Kids Water Night is on June 27th. There will be a giant water slide, a big slip and slide, barbecue, other water games. It's great fun for the whole family. Come along and join us. So that's June 27th, starts at 5.30. We can't wait to see you there. Hey, New Hope, today is the day. Today is the day that we have our brand new service times. So here at New Hope, we have four services on a Sunday, um, every Sunday. And so we have our 8 o'clock service and our 9.15. Those are staying the same. And then we also have our 11 a.m. service. That's a brand new service time. And also on Sunday nights, we have a 5 o'clock service time. So make sure you take note of that so you don't miss out on any of the awesome services that we do here at New Hope. As Chris just said, one of the new service times is 5 p.m. We've changed it from 6 p.m. to 5 p.m. And that enables us to get out a little bit earlier on Sunday evenings because we'd like to introduce a new format for our Sunday evening services. So ending at 6 p.m. means that we can do some small group type discussion afterwards. And that's an optional thing. If you've been wanting to be part of a small group but weren't sure where to plug in, this would be a good option for you. Our kids church starts right after family worship at the beginning of the service, and that goes all the way through to the end of our discussion time at 6.45. So if you're looking for a small group that has the option of childcare or kids church, then this could be a good place for you to plug in. We also do communion on the first Sunday of every month, and that happens to be this Sunday. We're also doing dessert this Sunday. So come along, we'd love to see you there. 
Now, I know we started things out a little bit different today, but I did want to take a moment and just welcome any of you guests that are here today. If this is your first time at New Hope, we just want to say thanks so much for coming. Welcome. We hope you feel at home. If you would, right in the pew in front of you, there's a card that says Connect Card. Fill that out. Let us know that you were here. We would love to send you some information on the exciting things that are happening here at New Hope Community Church. It is our vision and our passion and our desire to compellingly communicate the all absolute sufficiency of Jesus Christ. And so we want to be able to get you that information. Also, if you have a prayer request or a need, feel free on the back of that card, write that down, put it in the offering plate. We as a staff pour over these and pray over these every week because we want to be praying with you, New Hope Church. Thanks for joining us today. We hope that you experience your sufficiency of Jesus Christ in your life this week. Now that was entertaining. Uh, hey, going around our sign up sheets for the uh, Carnival 55, all right? That's not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. Uh, some of you are saying, Tim, some of us work. Yes, but some of you are already retired at 55. So this is primarily for that. For those of you who aren't retired, take a little extended lunch. Come join us that day. It is going to be a wonderful, wonderful day. So uh, there is, I just saw Jimmy Pardini last night at the Crime Stoppers uh, fundraiser last night. And uh, he said, in the midst of serving nearly 2,000 people dinner last night, he said, we're coming to New Hope. We can't wait. We're going to be ready. He's bringing fair tacos for us that day. And there's also going to be uh, hot dogs, and there's going to be cotton candy and snow cones and ice cream. Uh, there's going to be a dunk tank. You get to dunk your pastors, all right? Uh, you get tickets by playing the games, and that gets you all of your snacks and the opportunity to dunk the pastors, all right? So uh, come and join us that day. It's going to be a lot of fun. So please sign up. We want to make sure we've got more than enough food. There are lots of things over the next two to three weeks that are happening on top of graduation ceremonies and Grad Sunday and Father's Day Sunday. Uh, families within our church are connected to our community. Uh, are experiencing a great deal of loss. And uh, that, that adds a whole lot of stuff around here as well. And so uh, there is a memorial service here tomorrow for Lisa Perez's family. There is a reception here on Friday afternoon for Judy Woodley's family. There is a memorial service for a gentleman in the community. His last name is Wild. Not Wildy from our church, but Wild. Uh, that service is here. On, uh, on Saturday, there is the men's breakfast, there is the women's crochet, and then we have a memorial service for Stephanie Schwab, new to our church, 38 years old, passed away after a four and a half year battle with cancer. And that service is Saturday. So uh, if emails go out asking for help, all right, uh, we're going to need a lot over the next few weeks. So if you are available, please respond. And do so quickly if you can because uh, we've got to get things organized with so much which is happening. And uh, the following week, we have two memorial services on Saturday. And the following week, we have another memorial service. And I'll, I'll kind of cover all that in just a moment. But uh, please know we're going to be needing some help in these areas. Uh, if you are new to New Hope, you've been here less than a year, uh, I have invitations up here. I've tried to pass them out as much as I could, but if I missed you, I am so sorry. But uh, you can come up and pick them up off the, the, the front pew after the service is over. You are invited to our home on Thursday evening, June the 14th, uh, from 6.30 to 8.30 for homemade ice cream. We want to get acquainted with you. We want a chance to answer questions that you may have. We want you to get a chance to get to know uh, the pastor here a little bit better. Mark and Jennifer will be there as well. And uh, you'll get a chance just to get better acquainted and enjoy some wonderful homemade ice cream. We've got about 18 who've responded already. If you plan on coming, please RSVP and you RSVP to my email address and it's on here. If you didn't get one of these, uh, my email address is tim at newhopechurch.net. It's really easy, Tim at newhopechurch.net. We would love to see you there, all right? We're going to have a wonderful time that night. Um, <clears throat> let me highlight some prayer requests and updates for you. Great news. Marianne Levandusky, 
who had, as you know, she's battled cancer since the beginning of the year, been through chemo and radiation, shrinking tumors, hopefully to a size that they could operate on them. They did that at Stanford last week. They removed two tumors, both of them encapsulated. They had not yet invaded any of the organs or any of the tissues. Uh, she stayed in the hospital longer than they thought because it took a little while for her bowels to wake up. Uh, I had the opportunity to see her on Wednesday uh, in Stanford, and they were hopeful that she would come home, and I got the word this morning early, she is home. And so things are doing well. So we are very, very excited about how well things are going for her. Uh, yesterday, I had a memorial service out in Easton uh, for the Watson family, not from our church, but Johnny Watson. Uh, Johnny was supposed to be a boy. So that's how she got the name Johnny. All right, it's going to be John, and she ended up getting Johnny as her name. And uh, she, was, uh, she was a longtime resident in the uh, Carruthers Easton area, but in the last few years had been back east. So if you'd remember the Watson family, they would appreciate it. Rich Smith, our counseling pastor here at New Hope, he is going to be having an ablation tomorrow. So would appreciate your prayers as he goes through that process. Bernie Krauss goes this coming Thursday uh, to a specialty facility in the Bay Area to have the treatment done on his esophageal cancer. They got the news back uh, two weeks ago that this was stage one. Uh, they think with this procedure, it's kind of like um, an acid burn. And it sounds horrible, but it's less invasive than what it could be if it was surgery. And uh, they remove the top layers, all right, uh, on the esophagus, and then it will heal, and there should be no more cancer treatment necessary for him uh, after this. That is the hope and the desire. So be praying for them on Thursday. Um, Ralph Emery Service, uh, the retired highway patrolman from our church, is going to be on the 16th here at New Hope. Stephanie Swab Service is this coming Saturday at 3 o'clock. Um, Sarah Mayhew Service in Turlock, uh, missionary in Ivory Coast, Africa for many years, and one of my mom's best friends is this Saturday morning. And then uh, Joe Collins. We've been praying for Joe. He's been battling cancer as well. Uh, about, about four weeks ago, went under hospice care. Uh, when he got home, he rallied, did really well for about three weeks, and then began to decline. I was able to visit with Joe on Thursday. Um, he didn't want to wake up when I was visiting with him and, 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 and talk to him. He just was kind of in a sleep, sleep phase. Um, we gathered around, and I prayed for him. And at the end of my prayer, he opened one eye and said, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and then... Uh, then I told him, I said, now you treat your, 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 your wife and your daughters nice these next few days. And he said, I always do. And uh, I found out yesterday morning, those were the last words that he spoke to anybody. And uh, at 6.30 a.m. yesterday morning, he launched from his home to his eternal home. He went to heaven. And so Joe's memorial service is going to be on June the 23rd, all right, which is a Saturday here at the church. So lots of, lots of things that are, are happening coming up. Uh, Christy Chang, that is the Orr's daughter. She goes on Wednesday for two tests, uh, very, very important tests in regarding to a diagnosis of whether this is or is not Lou Gehrig's disease. So please be remembering to pray for them. Pat Williams' son had brain surgery last Sunday in Southern California, and the good news is that tumor was benign. And so he is already home from that procedure, and we are so very, very grateful. I got an email I want to read to you, uh, and I got permission in the last service to do that. This is from, uh, this is from the Krauss family as they uh, are heading down this week to, uh, to have this, or up this week to have the procedure done on his esophagus. How many of you are aware that we have a ministry in our church called Heart to Heart? You, you, you're aware of that. All right. Let me ask, how many of you have ever received a card from Heart to Heart Ministries? R raise your hand. I'll hold them up very high if you would, please. All right, you, okay, so there's probably about two dozen in here who have received a card. Here's, here's the deal. When, when they either notice in the bulletin or they hear an announcement or somebody tells us about something like cancer, something, some difficulty that they're going through, Heart to Heart Ministry picks up on that. They get the address. And uh, we've got a group of volunteers who say, you know, writing is kind of a gift that I have. I don't necessarily like to, not everybody says this, but some of them say I'm not a face-to-face -face person. I'm not a stand-up speaker, but I love to communicate God's love through writing. And so there's a team of how many? 
18 to 20? Thir I'm, 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 it's bigger than I thought. About 30 men and women in our congregation who, um, when they are notified, they accept the challenge and they write a card to somebody in a difficult situation. And this is a response. Let me, let me share it with you. After reading the heart-to-heart -heart card that I received for the second time, I felt I should let somebody know how much it helped me in the early stages of our battle. At that time, there was so much uncertainty and concern of what could or might be. This card and then a follow-up meeting with our pastor gave us focus and reinforced what we already should have known. God is with us. Our path is now much clearer, and apparently the cancer has not spread. We pray that our outpatient surgery on the 7th at the clinic in San Francisco will be all that's needed to eradicate the problem. Thank you again for the support that we have received from our New Hope family. A card really did make a difference from Nancy Krause. So if writing is a skill that you have and, and, and offering encouragement is something you would like to do, you can go to the website. There's a place to volunteer there. You can take a card in the pew in front of you and say, hey, I might like to volunteer for Heart to Heart. And it's also one of the reasons it's important for you to let us know when you're going through a difficult time because then we share that with the church family and we can behave like a family when we know what's going on, all right? So I thought that was a, a healthy thing for us to read. I'm gonna ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us today as we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you come, please? Join with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you so much for what you're up to in our lives. We know the desire of your heart is for us to, to sense your love, to accept your love, and then to express your love to others. We have become your hands and feet in this world. We have become your lips to share your love, your truth, your promises. Father, sometimes we do it as we speak. Sometimes we do it as we write. Sometimes we do it as we bake and cook. We find all different ways. Sometimes we do it with a visit and so we're so grateful, Father, for um, the opportunity to grow up in our relationship with you and for you to, to find ways to creatively express yourself through us so that others can know what your love means. Father, we trust you with the host of needs that we've already expressed here today, many others that are in our bulletin this morning. And then, Father, we even surrender to you those needs that folks have walked in here privately with. They've not shared it with any one of us, and yet these are needs that are important to them. And so, Father, I pray that together we will lay all of these things at your feet and say, God, I entrust these needs, these important, personal, private, sometimes public needs to you. And Father, I, I, I can't wait. I have a sense of expectancy about how you're going to be engaged in my problems, my frustrations, my challenges. So here they are. I give them to you. Father, thank you for the comfort that you offer to us when we go through some of the worst things this world does to us. You tell us in this world there will be trouble, but that you have overcome the troubles of this world. So, Father, we, uh, we look forward to you overcoming the troubles in our life as we give them to you. For the wonderful privilege of giving today a response of our gratitude toward you for all you've done to us. We do so cheerfully today. We love you. We can't wait to see what you have to say to us. We commit all this to you and even more in the name of your Son, our Savior, Lord, and love, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Come here, Kepler. Hey. I needed that today. Right. Ah, good stuff, man. This has been a just say amen kind of week. That was perfect today, guys. Thank you, all of you. Uh, I was sent a, uh, a text during... That's okay. That's okay. D d d we have insurance. All right. I was sent a uh, text during the uh, last service based on what the sermon was. And um, I, I, someday I'm going to get tech savvy enough to where I can just
play and I'll be able to show it on the big screen because I didn't have time to send it to anybody. Um, this is from a 16-year-old Buchanan student who at the state meet, she was ranked second, second in the state in pole vault. Okay, Second in the state at pole vault at the state meet this weekend. This is her post. This was definitely not the outcome I was expecting at state. What was the outcome? Her pole broke on her way up, snapped in two, face planted, okay, in the padding. This was definitely not the outcome I expected. I took another jump after I broke the pole, but I just couldn't hold it together. LOL. <laughs> Would you put LOL after that statement and after that experience? But th listen to this. This is what is so cool. <laughs> but this is just a mountain in God's plans that I must climb over. I can't wait to get back up and do it again next season. That is a 16 year old. God bless you. That is just awesome. Uh, may her tribe increase. We're talking about heaven these days, folks. We're looking at a series called What's Up With Heaven. As we look at this subject on heaven, we don't want to become people like the statement is that they are so heavenly minded they are of no earthly good. In the study of heaven, trying to find out more about what this place is that we are going to someday, and does it exist, and what's it like, and what's it's all about, we, 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 we investigate that for a purpose, and the purpose is, one, to have greater hope, to have greater joy, to have greater comfort, because as we all know, in order to go to heaven, what do we have to do? Die. Die. It's exactly correct. And there's been a whole bucket load of that this week. But what makes a difference as you deal with that is knowing where you're going. And, and, and not just knowing where you're going, but allow to know where you're going to make a difference in the way you live today. So there's this balance in this study that we're trying to find of, of talking about our hope in the future and making it real in the here and now. And so, a couple of weeks ago, we started looking at some of the particulars about heaven, and there are more particulars that we will investigate as the weeks go by. I'll give you a heads up now. What we're going to be looking at next Sunday for a couple of weeks is we're going to be looking at this subject of NDEs. It's got a lot of interest around the globe these days, and if you don't know what an NDE is, that's a near-death experience, okay? Folks have had them. Folks have written about them. Folks have talked about them. There's a variety of things out there. What is there for us to learn from that that may be of benefit? Is it all real? Is some of it contrived? Does some of it come from the evil one? What is there that can be garnered from these things that get a lot of attention called near-death experiences? But what we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks are some specifics about heaven. First of all, that heaven is a real place. It's not just some place that, that uh, disembodied spirits are floating around in another world that we never can figure out. Heaven is a place. The Bible talks about it. Heaven and what? Earth. Is earth a place? Yes. You're living in it right now. You're in this place. Just as earth is a place, heaven is a place. God uses a variety of descriptions in the Bible to describe this place called heaven. In some places it's described as a city. In some places it's described as a country. In some places it is described uh, as, and my favorite one, as the Father's house. You don't get much more real as a place than your Father's house. And Jesus wrote the words about my father's house. He spoke those words. And he preceded those words with this thought. Do not let your hearts be troubled. For in my father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. My father's house. Jesus wrote those words preceding the worst week of his life. Betrayal, arrest, imprisonment, beatings, 
publicly naked, a shame, crucifixion, death, burial. That was the week he was looking towards when he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. <laughs> Those of you who are invited to our home in a couple of weeks, the newbies, let me clarify, since what's been a lot in the news this past week is a TV preacher who's asking for money to buy a $54 million airplane. <laughs> Shelly and I do not have an airplane. I drive a Fiat, okay? It's electric. We do not have a 34,000 square foot home. We have about a 2,300 square foot home, okay? Uh, so if you come with an expectation of being at like that house, don't come. Okay, <laughs> uh, but we would love to have you while we have, but the Father's house is going to be on any wild imagination. It is a real place. Heaven is also a prepared place, prepared by Christ for a prepared people. You don't slip into heaven by accident. You will choose to go to heaven. You make a reservation, it's guaranteed. Trust me, nobody will be in your room when you arrive. It'll be ready and waiting for you. Heaven is a place of holiness. And by holiness, I don't mean boring. I mean holiness by, by, by the character of, of what things are like that are there and the character of what it's like because of some of the things that aren't there. Nothing will defile heaven. No funeral homes, no cemeteries, no hospitals, no orphanages, no prison, no police, no vices are tipped. And I didn't mean no police. I mean no police stations, okay? All right, sorry about that. <clears throat> No arguments or misunderstanding, no prejudice or, or, or racial discord. And you know what I just discovered this week? I forgot to include the list. You know what else won't be in heaven? No, there'll be plenty of food. <laughs> there will be plenty of food, all right? No preachers. No preachers, okay? Um, now, I, I hope preachers will be there just like police officers will be there, all right? But we won't be fulfilling our roles that we had on earth. Why? Because what's the role of a preacher? To proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> There's no more need for a gospel to be proclaimed in heaven. So I get a vacation. It's wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Um, he heaven is a, a place of internal rest. The burdens of life never will trouble us again. Anxieties will never overwhelm us again. Heaven will be a very active place. I think it's going to be a place of study, a place of exploration, a place of celebration. We do, I don't know who said food back there, we will eat in heaven. Matthew 8, Revelation 22, Mark 14, Isaiah 25. We are going to eat the best you have ever imagined in your life. I got to watch this family over here eat the other night, all right, at a restaurant out of the theater. Man, they were eating good, all right? It pales in comparison to what we're going to eat in heaven. And no calories, all right? No, yeah, it's just a, no cholesterol, all right? It's wonderful, it's wonderful. Um, you see, part of the thing is, is, guys, we have to realize the heaven that we go to right now when we die is not our final destination. And we'll talk more about that a little later. Don't want to confuse you. The heaven we go to now is not our final destination. And I'm not talking about that we go to some intermediary place. No, when we die here, we go to one of two places, heaven or hell. Very simple, all right? There's no in-between place. But here's the difference. The Bible says one of these days when Jesus comes back again for the last and final time, at that moment, that God will then create a new heaven and a new earth. Just as he gives to us when we go to heaven a new body, he is going to give to both heaven and earth. He is going to make it brand new. Why? Because rebellion has entered both places. Satan, Lucifer the angel, rebelled out of heaven against God. And, and, and then Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. As a result, both have been tainted. And he said, one of these days, I'm going to make it all brand new. But guess what? It's a new heaven and a new earth. Just as you and I and our new body are going to be recognizable in heaven, we are going to recognize the new earth. It'll be slightly different, okay? But I think there's going to be mountains. I think there's going to be valleys. I think you guys are going to, we're going to get to go hiking, all right? I got a feeling the ride down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon on the New Earth will be far more grand than the one I'm going on next month. By the way, I'm leaving in less than a month. I can't wait. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that out there to you. Uh, heaven is also what comes to us at the end of the Christian life. Now, we started a couple of weeks ago then looking at how do we think about heaven 
and still be of good use on earth? How, how do our thoughts about heaven impact us in a healthy, positive, maturing way on earth? And so we've looked at four benefits of being heavenly minded while on earth. We covered three of them last week. We're going to wrap up today by taking a close look at the fourth one. So let's see how well uh, you remember what we talked about last week. Number one, focusing on heaven while on earth reminds us of what? The first one. Brevity. The brevity of life. My dad is almost 93 years old. Next month, he'll be 93 years old. From, from some of your perspectives, y'all's perspective, that seems like a long ways away, all right? It'll be here before you know it. 93 years is nothing compared to eternity. And Thinking about heaven reminds us of that. The second thing focusing on heaven while living on earth prepares us to do is what? The certainty of judgment. Um, and, and, and I don't want to say, when we die and we know Christ, we go to heaven. So the judgment of whether I'm going to heaven or hell is instantaneous. All right, boom, it's, it's a done deal. But the Bible talks about another judgment, all right, where we stand in the presence of God and, and God reveals to us what our life on earth was like. And I don't understand how all this takes place, but I think there's going to be this revelation of, of those things that I did out of my own selfish nature versus those things that I did in dependence upon Christ. And we'll have an understanding now of what that was like. And the scripture says for those things that were honorable to the Lord, he is, it's an award ceremony. That's the way I've decided. Graduation taking place this week and lots of awards are being given out at graduation ceremonies. There's going to be some awards given out and then we're just going to throw all those awards back at the feet of Jesus. Because what we're going to discover is, is the reason we got the awards is because we turned Jesus loose in our life. Jesus is the one who did those things. The third thing that we looked at is focusing on heaven while on earth motivates us to live pure lives. You don't want to you don't want to show up all dirty to the wedding, do you? It challenges us to remind us that we are the bride of Christ. You and I as believers in Christ and now part of his church, that's referred to as the bride of Christ. That's just God calling. Answer him. Um, and if somebody's else, the next one that goes off, you get to stand and read scripture. No, just kidding. Just, that's just, a, just kidding. I'm just, just joking, just joking. Um, where was I? <laughs> oh yeah, our pure lives. Uh, we ought to grow in maturity from the time that we invited Christ in our life. We should grow in our dependence upon him and his righteousness being seen in us. And we spent quite a bit of time looking at stain resistors last week. If you've missed that, you can go to our website and you'll find the previous sermons there. So today we're going to pick up looking at number four, focusing on heaven while on earth puts suffering in a better perspective. Turn, if you would, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I want to read verses 6 through 18 together. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians can be found next to what? You guys are so smart. That's absolutely right. And you'll find it right before Galatians, all right? It's... Uh, it's to the right of Romans in the New Testament. Romans is a big book in the middle of the New Testament and Corinthians is to the right. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I've got to be honest, um, Philippians is probably my favorite book of the Bible. Philippians chapter 4. There are verses in Philippians chapter 4 that are my favorite verses in the Bible. But I've thought about this this week and I almost think that this particular chapter might be my favorite chapter in the Bible. There is so much that's good in it. But pick it up at verse 6. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, in our dark place, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure. What's the treasure? That's exactly correct. The treasure we have is the light. The Bible says that Christ is the light of the world. So when we talk about the light being the treasure, we're simply talking about who? Jesus, yeah. Always remember when a preacher asks a question, the answer 99.9% .9 of the time is what? Jesus. 
Jesus, yeah, yeah. And if it's anything else, find a new pastor, all right? Um, Jesus, he is the treasure that we have. But we have this treasure where, Paul said, in jars of clay. A lump of clay. That this all-surpassing power is from God and it's not from us. A jar of clay cannot produce light. Light is the gift that the jar is willing to receive. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not in despair. We have been persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our bodies. You see, folks, the death of Christ on a cross was the payment for our sin. That was the, 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 what was necessary to justify us. And then the risen life of Jesus Christ is how we are daily being saved. His death saved us from the consequence of sin. His life delivers us from the power of sin in our daily life. Does that make sense? We ta it takes both. If, if you only get half the message, you've got half the gospel, and you live half a Christian life. You're grateful that your sins are forgiven, but you never live in the light of Jesus Christ on a daily basis in your life. For we who are alive are always being given over to death, for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. This is another way, and Paul says it two or three different ways in different books. He says, I am crucified with Christ on a daily basis. I surrender myself to him so that it's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives through me. He says that in another way, I die daily. This is a day-by-day, moment-by-moment surrendering of my will to his so that it's not me govern my life, but it's him. Verse 12, so then death is at work in us, but life also is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All of this is for your benefit. You like benefits, don't you? Okay. If you go to work for an employer... You want to know two things, right? What are you paying me? And what are the benefits? When you get married, <laughs> you want benefits, right? All right? Well, the reason you get married, there's benefits that come along with that. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, because all of this is true, therefore we do not lose heart. We don't lose heart when we are being pressed on every side. We do not lose heart when we are perplexed. We do not lose heart when we are persecuted. We do not lose heart when we are struck down. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light, this is the key, for our light and momentary troubles... Is that the way that you look at suffering in your life? Understand, Paul is not making light of your suffering or his suffering. He, he describes his suffering here as persecuted, pressed, perplexed, cast down. In another place, he describes how many times he's been shipwrecked, how many times he's been arrested, how many times he's been beaten. He said... From lower level perspective, those are heavy burdens. But if you can see your earthly suffering from heaven's perspective, they become light and momentary. And they are achieving for us, for you and for me, an eternal glory that far outweighs a few of them, some of them, the ones I can handle? No, all of them. All of them, nothing left out. So what do we do? We fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. On the past two weekends, 
I've gotten a call to walk into homes and stand around a bedside and see the empty house of a child of God. What we could see was death. What we could see was empty. What I could see is hurtful. But because with both of them, with absolute confidence and certainty, knowing their relationship with Jesus Christ, we didn't dwell on the temporary, the shell of life that was now empty. But we focused our attention on what was unseen, the truth of the scripture that says to be absent from this shell, from this body, is to instantly be present with God. To know that the Stephanie who suffered for four and a half years with cancer, light and temporary, not from earth's perspective, but from heaven's perspective, because now all of that is finished, done with, never to occur in her life again. She is in heaven forever. And so we could hold hands with a sister and a mom and a dad. And with a heart filled with gratitude and hope, we could say, thank you for what is our hope. With a wife and a daughter and a son-in-law with Joe yesterday, we could stand around a shell, an empty house. And if all we had was to focus on what we could see, you want to know something? I would have never entered their houses over the last two weekends. If all, all I had was to look at what was left, without a hope of heaven, without a hope of everlasting life, without a hope of a place of no more fear, no more sickness, no more frustration, I promise you I would run as far from those homes and your homes on those occasions as I possibly could. The difference maker is who? Jesus, who says in my father's house I've prepared a room for you. Stephanie's room was ready. Joe Collins' room was ready. Sarah's room was ready. And trust me, when it comes time that our room is ready and we arrive, nobody will be in our room unless invited. Our suffering. It's a difficult matter to understand. When God permits affliction or loss to come into our lives, our humanity wants to cry out, why me, God? I mean, after all, I love you. I serve you. Why did you permit sorrow to happen to me? And just pause here. I don't have time for the whole theology lesson. Sorrow comes for a couple of different reasons. Number one, it comes because we live in a sinful world. Okay? Good things and bad things happen to all of us in this world. But bad things happen, whether we deserve it or not, because we live in a sinful world. Number two, bad things happen to us sometimes because we do really stupid things. Right? Have you ever done some things that weren't very wise in your life? Hmm? Yeah. Did you ever stop off at a bar, have a few drinks, get behind the wheel of a car? A whole variety of things could happen. It could go anywhere from something as simple as a DUI to a criminal arrest. I'm not here to condemn smoking. I enjoy a fine cylindrical object every once in a while. But you know what? If you're a two or three pack a day smoker and you do that for 25 or 30 years, are you really going to be surprised that you might have lung cancer? Sometimes we do things to ourselves. And then you have a situation like my mother. She was an absolute teetotaler. Her dad, my grandfather, smoked one to two pack of cigarettes every day. Died of a heart attack at 70. My mother never once put a cigarette to her lips, not one time in her life, even as a child. I don't know that my mother was ever rebellious, except as a married woman. Um, <laughs> Dad didn't hear that. That's good. Um, my mother never had a sip of alcohol. I mean, not a sip. Never in her life. Teetotaler. And yet the disease my mother was born with, which took her life at 81 years of age, gave her cirrhosis of the liver and emphysema. Light and momentary suffering. 
Why? Because she's part, not, in that case, not because of foolishness, part of a sinful world. But another reason for affliction, particularly upon the children of God, is to make us into instruments that will be of greater purpose for God's use. Let me see if I can illustrate. A lump of iron ore is violently ripped from its comfortable place in the earth. It's then shipped to some faraway place. And then tariffs are added to it. And then exp... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not opposed to tariffs. Sometimes they're good. All right, I'm not arguing that. I just couldn't help but toss that in. See if y'all were awake. And then the iron is exposed to melting heat. It's then poured into a mold. It's squeezed by rollers. It's smashed and pounded into shape. It's subjected to electric shock so it can bond other metals to it. And then later it is scraped against grindstones to give its final shape. And the result of all of that is a fine screwdriver that you use in your garage or a very fine, fine piece of tableware that you use at dinner. And it could never have existed except for the difficult experiences it endured to make it that way. One of the frequently asked questions to pastors is, why did God do that? That is a tough question. And maybe it's not the best question. God never completely answers the why questions in Scripture. However, he has given us a promise of heaven that puts suffering into perspective. The Apostle Paul, well acquainted with suffering, said, Our suffering is momentary and light in comparison to the eternal weight of glory. Even though Paul had been shipwrecked and imprisoned and beaten within an inch of his life on five different occasions, he describes those horrific experiences as momentary and light. How could he do such a thing? Did Paul have this kind of amnesia? Let me, let me see if I can illustrate. Uh, ladies who've had children. I understand, I don't know from personal experience, but I understand it's a rather excruciating process. <laughs> Okay, I, I've been in the room, but that's different than being on the table, okay? Uh, the closest thing, I, was I had a kidney stone a few years ago. I was told that's the closest thing a man will ever experience to childbirth. God bless you mothers, all right? God bless you for what you've done. And here's the thing. In the midst of all that pain, many of you looked at your husbands and says, this is the last time. <laughs> Only time. And in a matter of minutes, that beautiful bundle of joy pops into the world and you look at them and then you do it again. And some of you again and again. <laughs> you see, the blessing that comes after the pain helps you understand the pain is worth it. Paul is trying to get us to understand that when you compare current pain to what I am creating for you in heaven as an eternal weight of glory. It makes it worth it. You might be experiencing a difficulty right now you think will never end. Yet when compared to the time frame of eternity, it is only momentary. How long is eternity? Have you ever tried to get your head around forever? One writer describes it this way. He said, imagine a bird that comes once every million years to sharpen its beak on the top of Mount Everest. And by the time the bird has succeeded in wearing down the mountain to nothing, eternity will only have just begun. You see, the time of our suffering on earth is momentary when compared to eternity. Our afflictions, however unbearable, may also seem light when compared to the weight of heaven. Uh, would you describe a 2,000 pound block of concrete as light or heavy? Compared to a feather. But how about if you compare it to a 777 jetliner filled with fuel? Is the concrete block light or heavy? It's light. Similarly, the most horrendous difficulties we experience in life are light when compared to the indescribable future that God is preparing for us in heaven. Teresa of, 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 of Avila observed, in light of heaven... The worst suffering on earth, a life full of the most atrocious tortures on earth, will be seen to be no more serious than a one night in an inconvenient hotel. Focusing on the hope of heaven does not eliminate suffering in this world, but it does help us to put our suffering into perspective. 
We are in this world, but not of it. We were made for eternity. A French Jesuit philosopher put it best when he said, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, but we are spiritual beings having a human experience. C.S. Lewis said, if you think of this world as a place intended simply for our happiness, you will find it quite intolerable. Think of it as a place of training and correction, then it's not so bad. Our lives on earth are significant in the context of eternity. Let me show you something that I've never seen until I did this study this week. I had often read this passage that Paul wrote. I knew what it said, but I'd never connected to what the Apostle Paul said in this light. Notice when he says, light and momentary afflictions for our eternal weight of glory. Take careful note that in this verse, Paul lets us know God does not waste any of our struggles. Pause for a moment. Think of the three worst struggles you've lived through in your life. God will not waste it. If in dependence upon him, we trust him and his presence and his light in us to get us through those things, God says, I will not waste them. And one of the ways he will not waste them is he's preparing a wardrobe for us. It's kind of like when we get to heaven, we get to turn in our work clothes and you get to go on a shopping spree and everything is free at Neiman Marcus. Everything. And he said, that's what I am preparing for you based on what you have been through on earth. Revelation 3 says, we will be dressed in the purest and the brightest of garments. Things are looking better up there than down here, aren't they? There is something wonderful in this passage. If we believe it, we cannot help but shout. Trials? Ha! Bring them on. Testing? I'm ready. Pressure? Sure. Opposition? Heartache? Oh my, yes. Because what God is doing through me in this process is doing something incredible up there. It says, beyond our imagination, the weight of his glory. God wants his people to live victoriously, so he prompted the apostle to write this light and momentary affliction, preparing an eternal glory beyond all comparison. Make a small investment, you get a huge return with God. There is a contrast here we must see if we'll be victorious. God encourages us to contrast what is now taking in my play, in my life, with what is coming. Compare my trials to the glory he's going to give me. Remember that award ceremony? Someday in heaven? That's when it all comes true. The opposition we face compared to what's coming. Wow, over there, looking better than down here, isn't it? I want to encourage you by reminding you that troubles never come to stay in our life. Though you may face pressures till the day you go home, you are passing through this life and the time you spend now cannot even begin to compare to eternity. A dear old Christian woman was asked one time, what is your favorite scripture verse? And the elderly woman didn't even pause to think as she said, my favorite verse is that one that says, and it came to pass. And the young man looked at the older woman and he said, how can that be a favorite verse? It's not even a whole verse. And she said in very measured tones, young man, my life has been difficult. There have been many challenges. I've struggled many times and not always successfully. But I learned to say, it came to pass. My trials didn't come to stay, they came to pass. That is the spirit of the one who has understood what is happening. We can handle anything if we know it's not going to last forever. If it's not going to be with me all of my life. This passage teaches Christians, look not to the things that you see, but look to the one who is unseen. I fear that too many of us are looking in the wrong places for our relief. We're looking at what we earn and what we have invested now in a hope of financial stability. We are looking at success in our career. We're looking at how prosperous we can make ourselves look. We're looking at how many likes we get on Facebook. We're looking for how many virtual friends we have. We're looking for ideal relationships. I promise you folks, there's no ideal relationship. If you're looking for an ideal spouse, stop looking. All of us men are flawed. Your prance in shining armor will one day show up with a tarnished breastplate, a visor that can't be lowered, and a sword that's broken in the middle. That beautiful princess you marry, you will awaken some morning and she'll have dragon breath. <laughs> Shh. 
She might, though this has never happened to me, she might show up looking like something the cat had just drug in. <laughs> it is the nature of things. If you are looking for an ideal church and you think you found it, please do not join it. You will have just ruined it. If you are looking for the ideal pastor, you have not found him here, I promise you. I promise you, from the floor up, I am torn up. I am one flawed man. I know my condition. I know my failures. And thank God, I know a Savior who has set me free from the judgment of all of those. Amen? Amen. Perfection awaits the return of our Master. If the Lord has brought you through hard times, you are now able to testify that Jesus was your strength. It wasn't the college degree. It wasn't the money in the bank. It isn't how many people are your friends on Facebook. It wasn't the doctor or the lawyer. But it was God. And if that's true, just say amen. amen. When we begin to see matters in that vein, up there looks a whole lot better than down here, doesn't it? John Bradford in the 1500s wrote the following words. I am assured that though I want here, I have riches there. Though I hunger here, I will have fullness there. Though I faint and grow weary here, I will be refreshed there. And though I be accounted here as a dead man, I shall live in perpetual glory there. It's sure looking better there than it does here, isn't it? I got, I got one of the best emails this week a preacher can ever get. Let me read it to you. Pastor Tim, I went to New Hope from 2000 to 2005 before we moved to Ohio. One of the sermons you gave about dealing with a crisis has stuck in my mind over the years. You said then, asking, you said rather, let me read this sentence correctly. You said rather than asking, why me God, that we ought to ask, what now God? I have just been diagnosed with scleroderma, the kind that affects your whole body, including your organs. There is no cure. Most people die in three to eight years of diagnosis. While this is awful news, listen to this, this is so good. While this is awful news, I have found a new excitement about how God is going to use this for his good. I know this is a big challenge and it is a chance for me to witness to others and to be open to what now, God. Just wanted to let you know the sermon made a difference. That was over 15 years ago. What now, God? That's a heaven's perspective on the momentary light troubles of this world. Heaven is the promise that God would eventually make everything and all things right and he will one day fulfill our deepest longing. Although God's promise is yet future, it will make a tremendous difference in the way in which we live our lives today. How we wait for this place called heaven, whether with anticipation or anxiety, whether with focused or unfocused living, it matters both now and in the future. For what we do on earth today reverberates in the halls of heaven forever. I remember reading about a girls volleyball team. It was from a very small, obscure Midwest town that had assembled an unbelievable winning streak of 65 matches in a row. What was so incredible about this feat was the school only had 18 girls total in its student body. 16 of them were on the volleyball team. The 17th was the scorekeeper. I can only read between the lines, the 18th must have been the cheerleader. Although it was one of the smallest Class B high schools in the state, it won the Class B volleyball championship three years running. After 65 victories, they were eventually defeated. The local paper reported the defeat with a large headline one night. And then two days later, another headline appeared in the same paper. Team rebounds with a winning streak of one. <laughs> you see, the key to not losing heart is making sure that we understand and believe that even in the moments of defeat, we are being renewed inwardly by Jesus Christ. Defeats come and go in this life. That will never change until heaven calls us home. Yet for the Christian, defeat is one of those things that we strive to let Christ manage 
with a sweet expectation that even in defeat, we are victorious in him. Christians are always on the rebound. When one foot is mired in defeat, the other one is already moving towards a winning streak of one. Where are you right now? You coming through a defeat? Winning streak's over? Let the losing streak be over today. If you're here, you've never prepared your heart for heaven. Why don't you invite Jesus Christ in your life right where you're seated? No fancy prayer. You don't have to come forward and be public about it today. Someday I may ask you to do that, but not today. But why don't you invite Jesus Christ in your life? Use your own words. God, I want you. I need you. I want to go to heaven, not to hell. I want you to be in me between, between now and then. Most of you I know, and you're Christians already, but maybe you're in the valley of defeat. It's time to bring defeat to an end and start a new winning streak. And why don't you confess that which has prompted defeat in your life and say, Lord, I'm ready for you to put my feet on solid ground. I'm ready to live in the victory that you have offered for me. I'm ready to die to myself so I live with the presence of your son, the Lord Jesus, in me. You see, a heavenly perspective that helps us believe that there is better than here will make here better while we're on our way to there. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for life. Thank you for the hope of heaven. Thank you for what you want to teach us about our future home so it makes a difference in our present residence. The scripture in the song says, this world is not my home. We're just pilgrims and aliens traveling through. We have a forever destination. It's called heaven. Thank you for those who are at this very moment doing business with you. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Stay cool.